Good morning, everyone. I'm Howard Ricklow, a partner at Collier Bristow. Thank you for joining us. I'll be joined by my colleague Raj Shah in this webinar, where we're going to be looking at data processing arrangements and agreements between data controllers and processors. And as you will be able to see from your screen coming up, I believe. Yes, as you can see, we're going to be taking questions in the uh, latter part of the webinar. And I'll be asking a question on this area straight after my first part. Um, first, I'm going to be looking at uh, the respective roles and responsibilities of data controllers and processors. Um, probably most of you are aware that under GDPR, um, if you handle personal data, you're either a controller or a processor. And as you can see from the slide, the controller control uh, determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data, whilst the processor processes personal data on behalf of the controller. Um, why is it important to distinguish between them? Well, controllers have far more obligations under GDPR than processors, since they decide what personal data is collected and why, and they exercise ultimate control over the personal data. Uh, processors do have obligations uh, under GDPR and our, our Data Protection Act, um, but not as many, uh, but they must process personal data in accordance with the controller's instructions, which Raj will be talking about. Now, whilst the definitions make it look quite simple as to who the controller is and who is the processor, on every occasion you'll need to consider the personal data and the processing activity taking place, and which organization essentially is making the decisions, determining the purposes and the means of processing. Whilst the processor processes personal data under the instruction of the controller, a processor can, subject to the terms of its agreement with the controller, decide how to carry out certain activities on the controller's behalf in terms of the IT systems it's using, the methods it's using to collect the personal data, um, how to store it, transfer it or delete it, but uh, the processor can't take any major decisions as to what types of personal data to collect or what the personal data will be used for because those responsibilities are reserved to the controller. Now, it may not always be easy to determine who is the controller and who is the processor. And in some situations, the parties may both be controllers of the personal data. Now, gen today, generally, we're looking at relationships with controllers between controllers and processors, but we do need to consider uh, on each occasion, is it possible that in fact, the parties may both be controllers? But I say we're not looking at that direct relationship today. Uh, we're focusing on relationships between data controllers and data processors. Now, in some situations, it will be clear from the outset who's the controller and who's the processor. Uh, for example, payroll bureaus or IT cloud providers, um, it's generally clear that they are uh, data processors. Um, but bear in mind, it's not uncommon for a data controller to allow the processor a certain degree of discretion. So let's look at an example of IT service providers, such as a cloud provider. Um, now the IT services company will use a great deal of their own technical expertise to determine how it's best going to store the data in a safe and accessible way, uh, but it won't be a data controller since the controller retains exclusive control over the purpose for which the data is processed, if not exclusively over the manner by which the processing takes place. Now, it's also possible for an entity to be both a controller and a processor of personal data, but important to stress, not for the same processing activity. Uh, for example, uh, accountancy firms will usually be controllers of their clients' personal data in relation to their auditing function, tax advice, etc. Um, but they may also act for those clients as a payroll bureau, where they'll be, where they'll be acting as a, a processor, generally. And it's important in every case 
for you to consider each party's degree of independence in relation to the data processing activity. Um, if a would-be data processor starts processing personal data outside the controller's instructions, then that processor would be likely to be acting as a controller in its own right for the, that element of processing. And the parties would need to resume their discussions um, as regards that processor now assuming some controller role and agreeing what that role is. Now, Raj will be talking next about the contract between data controllers and processors. Uh, but first, a quick poll question for you. See if you've been following what I've been saying. Um, in the example about to come on your screen, who do you think is the controller? And who do you think is the processor? Now I'll give you a couple of minutes to read it because it's um, slightly detailed. Just give it another few seconds, Howard, and then I'll publish. Yes, I was going to say, uh, I'm sure everybody's scratching their head or not immediately uh, deciding. So it looks like we got the results of that poll, Howard. Um, yeah. So, ninety. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. carry on, Rod. No, I was going to say no. Ninety-one percent of you think it's a controller. Uh, nine percent of you think it's a. Oh no, nine percent of you are unsure. So Howard can can enlighten us. Yeah, I can. I can understand why some of you are unsure, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see so many got the right uh, solution. Perhaps the thing that threw some people, and perhaps that's why they're unsure is because um, what Bridge and Co are receiving is uh, pseudonymized, um, which means to say that they can't easily um, identify the data subjects. It would take some work to do so. They never receive or have access to the raw data. Um, but the fact is, um, and this is a critical fact, um, whatever it is Alistair Solutions are doing, um, they are doing it under the instruction of Bridge and Co, and it's Bridge and Co that are determining the purpose. Uh, therefore, they remain the controller, and Alistair Solutions are the processor. And we, we gave that example just to illustrate that it, it's not always easy to determine. Uh, I'll now pass you over to Raj, who's going to talk about the contracts between data controllers and data processors. Thanks, Howard. Uh, so now you've got a better idea of when your organization might act as a controller or a processor. Uh, the key point to remember is that if you act as a controller, so in the last example, that was Bridge & Co, as most of you rightly uh, understood. And if you appoint a processor to process personal data on your behalf, or if you are appointed as a processor on behalf of a controller organization, then you are required under Article 28 of the GDPR to have in place a written contract that contains specific clauses. So there are two ways of implementing this. Um, firstly, the main services contract, assuming you plan to have one, which as lawyers we'd always recommend, uh, can include the specific clauses within it. And that's probably the easier way of implementing this. If you contract on someone else's terms and there's a controller processor relationship established by the contract, then you need to check whether those standard terms include the mandatory clauses. The alternative option is that if the main services contract doesn't include the mandatory clauses, which might be the case, for example, if your organization still has contracts that are live that you entered into before the GDPR came into force, um, the alternative then is that you enter into a separate data processing agreement. 
The issue with doing that is you'll need to make sure that the separate data processing agreement is legally enforceable. So one way of ensuring that, um, it, and so if you're only coming around to putting in place a data processing agreement now in respect of the services agreement that might be a bit old or doesn't have the clauses in it, the way to make that legally enforce, enforceable could be to execute it as a special type of contract called a deed. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I've talked about mandatory clauses. So what actually are the mandatory clauses you need to have in place? So um, after the webinar, we'll circulate uh, a PDF which has Article 28, so you can see exactly what it says. But Article 28 essentially gives you a high level summary of what those clauses should contain. So to summarise, uh, the written contract must explicitly, explicitly state certain details of the processing activities um, and those I've set out on the slide. So the usual way to address this would be to set these out in a table that's appended at the end of the contract. So that's generally easier to do if the mandatory clauses are incorporated within the wider services agreement that sets out your whole commercial relationship with the other party, um, because that way you can fulfill some of these requirements quite easily. So for example, um, where you're required to state the duration of the processing, you can simply refer to the duration of the wider agreement. You also need to specify certain types of personal data. So that would be simply listing what kinds of personal data is being exchanged between the parties. So names, email addresses, telephone numbers, postal addresses, and so on. You also have to state the categories of data subjects um, who are the individuals the personal data relates to. So that could include customers, visitors, employees, and so on. And then the clauses also put certain obligations on the processor um, to ensure that their processing of the personal data is compliant. So the agreement must contain clauses requiring processes to process the personal data only in, in accordance with the controller's written instructions and to let the controller know if the processor has to process the, uh, the personal data outside of the scope of those instructions due to a legal requirement, and also to inform the controller immediately if the processor thinks that any of the controller's instructions uh, infringe the GDPR. Uh, the processor also has to ensure that its staff who undertake the processing are subject to confidentiality obligations. Um, it has to take relevant measures to comply with the GDPR security obligations, and it has to assist the controller with certain obligations that the controller has under the GDPR. So, for example, a requirement to notify the controller immediately if the, uh, if the processor is aware that personal data it's been processing has been hacked or lost. Uh, and there's more, which is on to the next slide. Um, the processor also has to delete or return to uh, the controller the personal data at the end of the provision of the services, not engage another processor, which is typically known as a sub-processor, without the controller's prior written consent and flow down all of these obligations to sub-processors because under Article 28, processors are basically liable to the controller for anything that their sub-processors do or don't do. And they, uh, the clauses also require you to have a clause in that um, uh, requires the processor to evidence compliance with everything I've just said. So for example, by providing details to the controller of the security measures the processor has in place, or its policies regarding retention of data and copies of sub-processor agreements. And the processor has to permit audits and inspections by the controller or the controller's mandated auditors. So moving on to the next slide, um, often we've seen controllers and processors simply replicate the text of Article 28 itself into the contracts um, as a kind of copy and paste job, but we wouldn't advise this for two reasons. Firstly, in September, the European Data Protection Board, which regularly issues um, guidance and in certain circumstances, legally binding opinions on how to interpret the GDPR, published new guidelines for public consultation. Um, and I've linked to that on the slide. And these guidelines stated, and I quote, the processing agreement should not merely restate the provisions of the GDPR. Rather, it should include more specific concrete information as to how the requirements will be met. So we don't have time to go through every single one of the guidelines, but four key points to note are as follows. Firstly, 
The agreement should contain uh, details of the security measures the processor is required to adopt, as well as an obligation on the processor to obtain the controller's approval before changing any of those security measures, plus a requirement to review them on a regular basis to ensure they're still appropriate. So one way of doing this might be to append the process information security policy, uh, if it has one, to the agreement. Secondly, the agreement should specify whether or not the processor is authorised to transfer personal data outside of the UK or the European Economic Area, or EEA. Those transfers are subject to certain conditions under the GDPR, which we'll discuss in a moment, so they need to be reflected in the agreement. Thirdly, the controller should specify whether specific sub-processes that it gives consent to the processor appointing um, so it's best if you can identify these by name and put a list of these in an appendix with a requirement to, for the processor to notify the controller if it wants to change this at any time with an opportunity for the controller to object. And fourthly, the guidelines uh, from the EDPB reiterate that the ways the processor is required to assist the controller should be specifically identified. So you need to spell this out. So, for example, you could refer to assistance with certain controller obligations like responding to data subject access requests. Another reason for beefing up these mandatory clauses is that you can use them to help leverage your commercial position, depending on whether you're a controller or a processor. So there are lots of ways. This. So if you're a controller, it's common in light of the high fines that can be imposed by regulators under the GDPR to require that your appointed processor indemnifies you for any losses or claims, including any potential financial penalties, uh, for any breach they commit of the legislation or the data processing agreement. However, if you're a processor, on the other hand, you could mitigate your risks by requiring the controller to warrant that it's got all the notices and permissions that it needs in place to transfer the personal data in question to you. Or even, as we've seen some processors do, require that any time you spend in assisting the controller with complying with its data protection obligations are additionally chargeable. So putting these in place, the mandatory contractual provisions is the responsibility of both the controller and the processor. So depending on which one you are, you shouldn't just leave this to the other party to sort out. And that's important because if you don't comply with Article 28, there's potentially a fine by the relevant regulator. And in the UK, that's the Information Commissioner's Office or ICO. And the fine for not having Article 28 provisions in place can be up to 2% of worldwide turnover or 10 million euros, whichever is greater. So that's obviously quite a scary thought. So to lighten things up, I'm going to move on to the next slide and ask you a quick pub quiz question to introduce the subject of international transfers, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So it's possible to send personal data to certain countries that aren't in the EEA and treat those countries effectively as though they were. And these are countries that the, um, have received what's called an adequacy decision from the European Commission. So which one, and there's only one, of the following countries has received an adequacy decision from the EU? Is it Australia, Singapore, Uruguay, India, or Ukraine? So I'll give you a moment to have a guess which one of those you might think it is, and there'll be a poll question now for you. So uh, this is an interesting set of results. Okay, so 41% of you think it's Australia, 34% Singapore, uh, Uruguay 17%, only one of you thinks it's India and only one of you thinks it's um, Ukraine. The actual answer, believe it or not, is not Australia, the, it's Uruguay. So well done to anyone who actually got that right and I hope you didn't cheat. Uh, so Howard will now explain more about adequacy decisions and the other options for international transfers of personal data. Thank you, Raj. Yes, um, the country's receiving adequacy, I'll turn to um, shortly as well. It's, it's not necessarily the obvious ones. Uh, I'm not surprised we want to talk to Australia. Uh, in fact, New Zealand does have adequacy, Australia doesn't. So it's not as straightforward as you'd think that because the country's particularly sophisticated or has great IT activity, um, it's quite a fight to get adequacy. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the transfer of personal data outside the EU to what are known as third countries. Um, we're going to be looking later at what Brexit might mean in this regard, and Raj is going to look at something called the Schrems II decision. Uh, but for now, I'm going to look at the ability to transfer personal data from the EU or EEA to third countries. 
The first thing to look at in every um, every patient you're acting for a client or you are yourself transferring personal data to a third country is, as Bart has mentioned, has that country received an adequacy decision by the European Commission, which means that country's been determined to ensure an adequate level of pr protection. And th if the country does have adequacy, there, there's no specific authorization is required. Um, to transfer the data to those countries. And at the moment, the countries uh, did, that have adequate de decisions in place um, are Andorra, Argentina, Canada, and certain organizations in Canada, Guernsey, Israel, Isle of Man, Japan, Jersey, um, New Zealand, Uruguay, Switzerland, and not least uh, the Faroe Islands, which may surprise some. They're known as the white list countries. There used to be, as some of you will know, something called a privacy shield between the EU and the US, which gave them the equivalence of adequacy subject to certain safeguards, but that's no longer in place as a result of what was called the first trends decision. And as I say, Raj is going to talk about the second trends decision shortly. So the next port of call, um, if the country concerned hasn't received uh, adequacy, um, is where there are appropriate safeguards in place. Um, one of the series of safeguards is, is called, are called binding corporate rules, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly. But the, 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 the most common um, appropriate safeguards are standard data protection clauses that have been adopted by the European Commission known as the standard contractual clauses. Um, and, and these are means of, of ensuring there are appropriate safeguards. And in fact, at the moment, there are four sets of standard contractual clauses, uh, two dealing with controller to controller arrangements and two dealing with controller to processor arrangements. And they've been developed over a number of years. Um, they follow a similar structure uh, under each of the controller processor um, standard contractual clauses, the exporter confirms that it's complied with its own national data protection legislation until transfer. And then the clauses set out obligations on the data importer to comply with EU style data quality obligations and restrictions. There's also a clause which grants third party rights to data subjects so they can enforce certain provisions of the clauses themselves. Um, the clauses for the data processor don't require the data processor to comply with all EU style data quality obligations and restrictions. Um, instead, there are obligations placed on the processor to comply with the security arrangements specified by the exporter and usually set out in one of the annexes to the clauses. But um, has to be said, the standard contractual clauses even the latest ones we have are somewhat out of date and no longer necessarily fit for purpose. And now at last, there are new draft standard contractual clauses, which the European Data Protection Board, which Rod mentioned, was prepared for consultation. And I'll touch upon those later on. Now, the other, um, other appropriate safeguards I mentioned are something called binding corporate rules. Um, we don't have time to deal with them any depth depth other to say, than to say they facilitate the transfer of personal data within a group of companies. But it takes a lot of time for the groups to draft and agree them within the groups. Um, they have to appoint a lead supervisory, supervisory authority in one of the EU states, which will act as its lead authority. Then the document has to be circulated to two additional supporting author authorities. And finally, they're submitted to the European Data Protection Board for its opinion. Um, so as you can see, it's a very, very long-winded process um, and not, in my experience, that, that common. We ne next come to derogations. Um, now, there are a number of derogations which may possibly be utilized um, where there's no adequate is adequacy decision um, be or because the transfer is urgent and there's no time to implement the standard contractual clauses. Uh, I'm only going to mention in our allotted time today the derogations, which I think uh, may be of particular interest to you. Um, the first is consent. Um, now, it's important to emphasize that it's explicit consent, the consent that's required here. And it's where a data subject has explicitly consented to a proposed transfer 
and this is important, having been informed of the possible risk of such transfer for the data subject due to the absence of an adequacy, an adequacy decision and appropriate safeguards, then the personal data may be transferred. And secondly, there are two relevant derogations under Article 49 where there is a contractual necessity and it's either because the transfer is necessary for the performance of the contract between the data subject of the controller or the implementation of pre-contractual measures taken at the data subject's request or where the transfer is necessary for the conclusion or performance of a contract concluded in the interest of the data subject between the controller and another natural or legal person. So trying, if you're going to utilise contractual necessity, you need to look very carefully at whether the circumstances fit within this derogation. The only other one um, I'll mention uh, today um, is, uh, well, there are others, as you can see, important reasons of public interest and exchanges um, where there are data exchanges between competition authorities or tax and customs administrators but I, I'm going to mention today the last bullet point there um, which is um, transfers for compelling legitimate interest with appropriate safeguards. Um, the compelling legit legitimate interest here is of the controller and that mustn't be overridden by the interests or rights or freedoms of the data subject. It mustn't be repetitive and involve only a limited number of data subject. Uh, data subjects and the controller has to have assessed all the circumstances surrounding the transfer and on the basis of this assessment has provided suitable safeguards for the transfer so again you can see a number of steps that need to be gone through and most importantly here and mustn't be forgotten there's an obligation on the controller to notify the supervisory authority that's the ICO in our case that the condition has been used and it's also important to um, realise that the, the the fact that this uh, derogation is being utilised uh, and the safeguards being employed need to be noted in the Article 30 registration of transfers. Um, so I think that completes me on that part and I'm going to hand you over to Raj who's going to talk about um, Schrems 2. Thanks, Howard. Um, so how the GDPR regulates international transfers received a fair amount of press coverage this summer in a case which Howard said is called Schrems 2, and that reached the European Court of Justice. Uh, I'll spare you the finer details of the case, because if you're anything like me or Howard, the sheer excitement of the case details might be too much to bear. Uh, so I'll just concentrate on the implications, and they're two main ones. Firstly, uh, the mechanism that permitted international transfers of personal data from the UK and the EEA to certain certified organisations in the USA uh, called Privacy Shield has been invalidated. So if you're contracting with an organisation based in the US who provides standard terms that refer to Privacy Shield, it may well be the case that those are now out of date and aren't compliant with the GDPR. So that's one to watch out for. Secondly, where you are relying on uh, standard contractual clauses or SCCs, which are one of the appropriate safeguards that Howard just mentioned, uh, when you're relying on those to send personal data outside of the EEA, simply putting those in place is not enough now. You're also required on a case by case basis to verify whether the destination country affords equivalent levels of personal uh, of protection of your personal data as within the EEA and to supplement the SCCs with additional measures. And that's obviously quite a tall order because um, it's effectively putting a burden on organizations who are exporting personal data to undertake an adequacy assessment. That's really the job of the, the European Commission. Um, so fortunately, two weeks ago, we did get some clarity on what's expected by way of some guidance from the European Data Protection Board. Um, and I put the link to that on the slide. And the key takeaways from that uh, are as follows. Firstly, um, you need to assess whether the laws and practices in the destination country could undermine the protection the SECs are supposed to give. So that includes considering whether access to the personal data by government or surveillance authorities in the destination country is likely and whether if that is likely access to the personal data might cause the SECs to be ineffective. 
And one of the two pieces of guidance that I've linked to on the slide sets out four criteria against which to assess the surveillance laws of the destination country. And I've summarized those four criteria on the slide for you. The guidance also says that your investigation into the laws and practices of the destination country should include existing information sources, such as case, such as case law uh, and reports from academic institutions. So one way to fulfill that requirement might be to instruct a law firm in the destination country to provide a legal opinion that takes into account all that information. You also need to consider how you can supplement uh, the existing standard contractual clauses with additional provisions. So you can't actually amend the, con the content of the SECs themselves, but you can add to them, provided that what you add doesn't conflict with them. So examples might include requiring the data importer to warrant that the laws of the destination country don't prevent it from performing its obligations under the SECs, and that they don't require the importer to facilitate uh, the access of personal data to government or surveillance authorities. Uh, also requiring the importer to notify you as the exporter as soon as it suspects there's been any surveillance authority access to any of the personal data that it processes, with a right for you as the person transferring personal data out there to terminate or suspend the data transfers as soon as you receive that notification. Um, alternatively, you could also require the data importer to have certain security certifications, such as uh, international standards like um, ISO 227001. In addition, uh, you could also consider what practical measures you can put in place with the data importer. So, for example, you could make sure that any transferred personal data is encrypted with only a limited number of staff in the importing organization having access to the encryption key and those staff having effective training on their data privacy obligations. It's important to make sure you document everything you do in terms of that um, to ensure your compliance with the GDPR's accountability duty. Also, if the conclusion of your adequacy assessment is that a proposed international transfer can't be undertaken without undermining the SECs, then you simply shouldn't proceed with the transfer. You'll also need to um, keep the situation under regular review. Because of Brexit, the UK's own regulator, the ICO, uh, no longer sits on the European Data Protection Board. So that means we're also awaiting separate guidance on the ICO on how to address these issues. Although realistically, it's unlikely to diverge from what the European Data Protection Board's already said. There's more to consider in terms of how Brexit will affect the data protection regime in the UK. So we'll now move on to the next slide and Brexit will be the last item we discussed before the Q&A session at the end. So, Obviously, Brexit's a really complicated issue. Um, we've been living through it for four years, so and we're only going to cover this in about five minutes. So um, there will be, um, and there's a lot we still don't know. But essentially, when the Brexit transition period comes to an end, which is still scheduled to be at the end of this year, um, the UK will be a third country outside of both the EU and the EEA. So that means the GDPR will no longer have direct effect in the UK. So that doesn't mean everything that Howard and I have just said is somehow going to just be redundant, because at that point, we'll have in place what will be known as the UK GDPR, which is essentially the existing GDPR copied and pasted into UK law with some minor tweaks. Um, so that means if you're doing business in both the UK and the European economic area, you'll have to comply with both the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR. So initially, that should be straightforward, because as I've said, to start with, the UK GDPR won't really differ significantly from the EU one, although that, that could change over time. The UK will also recognise the existing EU adequacy decisions. Brexit also means that transfers between the UK and the EEA will now be international transfers. So that means you'll need to rely on one of the appropriate safeguards that Howard discussed. From the UK perspective, transfers to the EEA will be deemed adequate. So that's quite nice and easy and straightforward. However, this isn't reciprocal because it's unlikely uh, that the EU is going to grant the UK an adequacy decision anytime soon, partly because it's got concerns about the UK's own domestic surveillance regime. So while that means your transfers of personal data to organizations in the EEA can basically continue as usual, getting that data back from the EEA might be problematic. So in the absence of the UK getting an adequacy decision from the EU, using the current standard contractual clauses to transfer data back from a processor in the EEA to the UK wouldn't work because 
Um, the standard contractual clauses that we have at the moment are only used for controller to processor transfers, not the other way around. But fortunately, we've got Howard on hand to explain uh, what steps you can take to address this. Yes, thanks Raj. Um, well, yes, and as mentioned previously by myself, the um, European Commission's released a new set of start a draft standard contractual clauses uh, for the transfer of personal data to third countries, which failing absent uh, an adequacy decision, we will be. Um, it's thought that we finalise next year and organisations have got a period of one year from the date of entry into force to put the new SCCs in place. Um, New SCCs have covered transfers of personal data from within the EEA to third countries. Um, and there are now four um, types of draft CCCs that have been um, circulated. There's going to be controller to controller, controller to processor, processor to controller, and processor to processor. Um, they're, there, they're therefore far more helpful than the existing SCCs, which don't deal with processor to controller transfers nor processor to processor transfers. They're actually going to be in a different form to the existing versions. So there will now be general clauses which can be adapted with certain modules uh, to allow for more freedom in drafting. Um, but as I've said, they're presently out for consultation. So we'll need to see what they eventually look like. Uh, but I think it is likely they will be utilized um, by um, post-Brexit by um, in relation to transfers back to the UK from the EEA. Uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, there are other implications of Brexit. Uh, first, at the end of the transition period, uh, UK controllers or processors will need to appoint a data protection representative in the EU, um, and also non-UK, both EU or non-EU controller or processors need to appoint a data protection representative in the UK. Um, there will be no need to appoint a representative if processing is occasional and where it's unlikely to pose a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons, taking into account the nature, context, scope and purpose of the processing. Uh, but the exception doesn't apply anyway if there's large scale special categories of personal data being processed nor criminal convictions. So, the fact that the processing can only be occasional means it's probably of little uh, practical use. Um, so what does the representative need to do? Well, they must be designated in writing and they must be given a mandate to deal with queries by supervisory authorities and individuals. So importantly, um, the identity and contact details of the representative must be included in the privacy notices that you send out um, to individuals under articles 13 or 14. Um, the representative also must maintain a record of the processing activities of the controller or processor under Article 30. Now, GDPR actually says very little about the role of the representative, uh, but the recital, recital 80 to the GDPR says that the designated representative should be subject to enforcement proceedings in the event of non-compliance by the controller or processor. And the guidelines to GDPR suggest that the, possi the possibility of imposing administrative fines and penalties on representatives. So um, representatives um, who you may approach, um, I'm sure will have a lot of um, thought about whether they want to undertake these obligations and under what conditions uh, they're prepared to act as a representative. So we'll have to see how that develops. And uh, finally, I should mention the one-stop shop uh, which allows a supervisory authority in one EU member state to be the lead authority on a matter which involves other concerned um, supervisory authorities will cease to apply to us post-Brexit. Uh, the, the aim of the one-stop shops to produce a decision which will be accepted by and binding on all relevant supervisory authorities. Um, it consists of cooperation procedures which aim to produce a one-stop by consensus and consistency, um, a, a mechanism which means that all of the supervisory authorities can agree where there is one member state taking the lead. Because post Brexit, um, that won't apply to us. And as Raj has mentioned, um, our information commissioner has already ceased to participate in, in the uh, European Data Protection Board. Well, OK, that concludes our talk and I think we've now got time for some questions.
Yeah, we've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions. So if you haven't actually had a chance to submit any, you can do using the Q&A um, uh, little button at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, so we've already got a few submitted, so we'll try and get through as many of those as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, so, OK, we'll, so we'll take the first one. So um, this is quite a good one. Um, if a processor is processing within the EU, but the controller is actually based outside of the EU, does the processor have obligations then under the GDPR? Would you like to deal with that, Howard, or do you want... Howard, Howard? Okay, you, I'm sorry, the questions haven't appeared on my screen, so if you would... Um... Okay, yeah, so, so basically, so I'll just repeat the question. Um, that if the um, processor is, if you've got a pro situation where the controller is outside of the EU, so the controller is outside of the EU, but the control, the processor is within the EU, um, does the processor have obligations under the GDPR? The short answer to this is yes, it does. Um, and basically the regulation will apply because um, the GDPR um, applies. So basically uh, the, the uh, rep area of the GDPR that I would point you towards is um, Article 3, and that deals with the territorial scope um, of the GDPR. So basically, Article 3 says the GDPR will apply to any processing of personal data, uh, whether you're a controller or a processor, um, if you're out, even if you're um, not established in the European Union, if the processing activities relate to providing goods or services to um, individuals based in the EU, or if the monitoring of their behavior takes place within the EU. So I think in your example, if the processors uh, based in the EU and as actively, you know, is monitoring the, the individuals within the EU, so do undertaking processing activities within the EU, then it's likely, yes, that the GDPR um, would apply. Um, another question we had was, um, whether you need to sign SECs or if you can incorporate them by reference. Um, I don't know if you want to take that one, Howard? Yeah, they do need to um, be signed. I mean, they, they need, generally um, there has to be um, an, an agreement um, between controllers and, and, and processors. Uh, and I think Raj, I'm correct in saying that there is a, a space to actually sign on the dotted line on the SECs, and or not? Yes, yes, there is. So there is already one. Um, I mean, Obviously, if you're incorporate, you can just you can incorporate the SECs by reference, but I wouldn't just you know hyperlink to them. I would actually you know write them all out um, and you know copy and paste them. And then if you have it as part of a wider contract, that's fine. But you must make sure that the SECs are there in their entirety. And as I mentioned before, they can't be amended, but they can be added to, provided what you're adding to them doesn't conflict with what they already say. Um, another question is. Um, from the 1st of January 2020, how likely is it that the ICO is going to start taking action for non-compliance? Um, their website is not very helpful in what is expected of UK companies after Brexit. I don't know, so I'm not sure what kind of type of non-compliance you might mean, but generally the ICO has actually been pretty active so far already. Um, and I think it will continue to do so after Brexit, because I think it takes its obligations quite quite seriously. Its, its website is probably one of the most detailed, I think, in terms of um, ex what it expects of organisations to do, certain by com certainly by comparison to certain European equivalents. So, for example, if you go on the Italian Data Protection Authority site, it doesn't actually have that much information, whereas the RTO has got reams and reams. And I think they'll, they will take quite a dim view of non-compliance because as I mentioned the GDPR is effectively staying here it's not going anywhere in the UK because we're going to have a basically a copy and paste situation um, to begin with um, and linked to that is is a question we've had is so what is the difference between um, the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018 so these are actually two different things. Um, the Data Protection 2018 sits alongside the GDPR. So from a UK perspective, you need to look at both pieces of legislation. Um, what the Data Protection Act effectively does is supplement what the GDPR says, and in some cases derogates it from it, where this was allowed for in the GDPR, where they allowed member states to, 
to derogate in certain areas. So what, what I'm calling the GDPR is effectively what the UK's version of the GDPR will be known as after Brexit, after the end of the Brexit transition period. And that will be a separate piece of legislation from the Data Protection Act 2018. And you'll need to comply with both after 31st of December um, this year. Um, I've got a question for you, um, Howard, on Article 49. Um, uh, there, someone's asking, could you um, come back on Article 49 and the obligations of controller and processor? For instance, uh, a financial intermediary uh, will transfer financial information to its local tax authorities, which will then be transferred to those countries of the individuals being reported. Those could be um, within or outside the European economic area. Could you please elaborate again on what the obligations of the controller would be, especially given that the financial institutions will not have a data processing agreement with tax authorities? Hmm. Um, I, I don't think this is one, frankly. Um, we can answer very simply here. Um, happy to drop you a line on it, but I think um, it, it, it's fairly complex and uh, will require slightly more detail to come back on that. Um, we've also got questions about um, uh, the um, requirement for data protection representatives. How, what's the best way to appoint an EU-based data protection representative after the Brexit transition period? Um, so there are actually, so I mean, how would, um, will, might have some stuff to say, but there are now that, that yeah. do provide these services. Um, yeah, they've they're, actually they're, thought of Brexit in advance and started marketing this. Yeah, there are. I think there are law firms, there are outfits that are already um, in effect uh, data protection officers uh, that are well used to um, data protection uh, legislation, their duties on or, or, or advising other organisations. So they are uh, setting themselves up to do this. I would imagine um, that there will be um, very stiff provisions. Certainly, I would think they will require uh, indemnities, um, which you touched upon, Raj, earlier in relation to controller processor agreements, because, and although, as I mentioned, GDPR doesn't uh, go into great detail, um, they do have exposure um, to uh, fines, in theory, and I think they will want to do their own due diligence on the controller or processor in question um, so that they're um, not landing themselves with a lot of work. Uh, and I think the point I was trying to get across is it's more than the situation at the moment where a, a, a law firm or an accountancy firm can act as a registered office for their uh, overseas clients and, and, and vice versa. Um, here, um, the representative is taking on a lot of responsibility with potential liability. But yes, people are marketing themselves um, to, to be able to undertake that task. Um, we've also been asked if a UK registered business already abides strictly to the GDPR requirements, is it necessary to include the new standard contractual clauses in contracts with EU based clients? If yes, by when should the SECs be put in place? So this will depend on the basically the flows of the personal data for any flows of personal data from the UK to the EU after the 31st of December that can continue as normal and there's no change you need to make because um, the UK is essentially recognizing the EEA as adequate the problem is is that it's not going to be the other way around so the EU doesn't look like it's going to recognize the UK as adequate. So if you're in a situation where you're sending personal data to the EEA but need to get it back, then you need to think about putting in place um, some kind of mechanism um, as an appropriate safeguard to cover that. So for example, um, if you have, for example, you've, you've got a payroll service that's actually based in the EU, so you're sending employees personal data outside to the EU, but then you need to get that personal data back because they need to do their pay slips and then you need to get send the pay slips back to you in the UK, that wouldn't be covered by any kind of adequacy decision because the EU is not recognising for the moment the UK um, as an adequate country. That's a really a tricky one because there's no real answer 
to this. I think the ICO isn't going to really be looking at enforcing that particularly because it's it's just a, an issue that's 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 fallen through the cracks because of Brexit. As Howard mentioned, this may be rectified pretty soon because there are going to be new standard contractual clauses coming into force soon around spring next year, we expect, which will cover the situation of processes to controllers. So in that scenario, the payroll provider in the EU could rely on the processor to control a new standard contractual clauses that will be adopted by the European Commission, we hope, in spring next year. And then that would need to be put in place with your organisation in the UK to cover the transfers of personal data back from the EEA to, uh, to the UK. OK, I think there's another one which uh, possibly may be the last we can take. Um, someone said you mentioned an indemnity for a processor's data breaches. Uh, when are these negotiated? What's the typical way to cap it? As presumably the value of the agreement isn't linked to the potential fine. Very good question. Um, and in fact, it's not um, extraordinary for the processor themselves to require an indemnity. So this is um, often an area which is very heavily negotiated. And as you quite rightly said, um, the value of the agreement may not be particularly substantial, yet the potential fine can be. Um, and there, is, when is it negotiated? Well, it should be negotiated whenever the agreement between the controller and the processor is being entered into. Of course, as Raj mentioned, it, that may be a small part of a larger commercial agreement pinned on as an appendix or just have a couple of clauses so saying that the parties will abide by GDPR and Data Protection Act. Um, needless to say, if it's not um, negotiated and the parties just sign an agreement without regard to that, it's going to be very difficult to open up the discussion. So it must be discussed and thought about. But yes, the parties need to be realistic. Um, yes, there could be a 20 million euro fine um, for a breach by the processor. Um, but equally, the processor is liable to fines themselves. Um, I think people forget that. So there needs to be a, a, a proper negotiation and a realistic one and has to I should mention also that parties sometimes have insurance cover for this and that often enters it into it vis-a-vis -vis should there be a cap but yes I think it would be in, in rather in our in my experience it would be unusual um, for a processor to accept uh, an uncapped breach um, yeah, certainly. I think when the GDPR came into a force, um, controllers typically asked for uncapped indemnities and some processes might have signed up to that. But as clients, uh, as, as various organisations have become more sophisticated and more familiar with the requirements of the GDPR since uh, since 2018, that's it's unlikely now in our experience that a processor generally agrees to that. The exception might be where really they really desperately want the contract and, and they're just willing to accept it so i think so for certain public sector contracts that are let by contracting <laughs> authorities they sometimes still insist on an uncapped liability but otherwise it's very much what the level of the cap is is, is negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis and sometimes you might get certain industry standards as well in terms of what is common in the market okay um I think that's probably as much as we've got time for today. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I hope, hope that was helpful. And yeah, uh, I think on our slides, you have our email addresses if you have any follow up questions. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And goodbye. <laughs>